I must be able to convert the resources of the earth into higher and higher capability of service. I must do more and more with less and less until I reached a point where we could do so much as to be able to service all men in respect to all of their needs. And so in 1927, realizing that there was nobody to tell me to undertake a comprehensive uh, anticipatory design science with respect to the total resource of the earth, I decided to initiate in the design and become the prime designer myself. We have with us today an unusual person, rather a remarkable person. Mr. Fuller is described as an architect. He is that because of his intense concern with living space. But he is something more than an architect because his obsession is with the architecture of the universe. We all have heard of Mr. Fuller's invention, the geodesic dome. It is a brilliant use of space and material. Then the world map and other items. Mr. Fuller has shown how to get the maximum from the minimum material by making the most intelligent use of the resources available on Earth. He has often spoken of how he was born with the handicap of farsightedness. As a child, he could see the far off things clearly. And as a young man, he lighted upon the idea that if Einstein is more right than Newton, then the mind ought to live in tune with the speed of light. In 1927, I was completely inspired by the birth of a new child, our first child having died five years earlier. And I uh, had good cause with our first child to feel that children are endowed with a great deal more than any of us know, that every child may be born a great genius, that they simply lose these faculties of genius at an early age due to the non realization of their presence by the parents and to environment. I said, I'm really going to give the rest of my life to the new young life. I pledged both to my daughter who died and the daughter who's now born. I was committing myself to humanity. The money, I think, is absolutely irrelevant. I see it's really man and his environment in his time. And you can get the environment to begin to do work with you. I'm not trying to imitate nature, I'm trying to find the principles she's using. In uh, literature, there's something called generalization, which is trying to cover too much territory, too thinly to be persuasive. But in science, we have a generalization. The scientific generalization means discovering a principle which holds true in every case and never fails. As for instance, I, I'll give you a typical one. We have a man going through the forest, and he's climbing over trees, old fallen wind-blown trees. And he's climbing over one when suddenly the one is on, he feels it's sinking rather slowly, and he retreats a little and doesn't sink, and it goes back and sinks. And he turns around to see what's going on. He's lying over the top of another tree, and the other end of his tree he's standing on is under a very great big tree, and he suddenly sees that great big one lifting. And he goes over then and tries to lift that big tree with his muscle, and he finally can't budge it. So he thinks the tree he has over here, which is lifting it, is a magic tree, and he dra drags it home. And he uh, keeps it there, and, uh, and all the family and, uh, and tribe worship it for a thousand years, and suddenly somebody discovers that any tree will do. That's what we call then the principle of leverage. That's a generalized principle. And if it's out to show you, I just take this little very light bar, and I'm pretty lightweight. This, this big log has been lying here on this beach probably for 10 or 20 years, hasn't been moved at all. So I just See what I can do with it. There goes the big tree lifting. Very much more than my weight. So I'm bouncing. This is where a man then demonstrates what he calls advantage. This is the beginning of the very word advantage. See, all around us are these generalized principles. There's a generalized principle of tension and compression. 
when you pull on a piece of rope like that, it gets tauter and tauter, means it contracts as it goes. So it goes in compression 90 degrees to my tensing. When I load a compression member from above here, it, it, it's the girth gets bigger, so it goes into tension at 90 degrees to the compressing. These are the typical of the way in which the, we find these generalized principles right here on, on Bear Island. Things like this going on being employed by a man, because just right over here on the other side of the eating house here, we're using a tension and compression very big way. Look at, look at the, look at boats. The compression mass, the tension stays, the tension halyards, the tension sails. Here we get a beautiful differentiation of, of tasks, the, the tension versus the compression. All around you, it looks kind of tumultuous and, and jumbled up. You begin to discover order is always operating. The nearest thing to the total patterning of all the patterns of complexity in the universe that we can find to the universe itself is man. Let's identify man to start off with as what I call a pattern integrity. And I'd like to make clear what I mean by pattern integrity. I'm going to take a piece of, of manila rope, and then I'm going to splice into it a piece of cotton rope. Splice on the other end of the cotton rope a piece of, of nylon rope. I'm going to make the very simplest knot that I know, which is simply to go around like 360 degrees in this plane, 360 degrees in that plane. I'm not going to pull it tight. There's that knot where the, the rope has not done this. I have done it to this to the rope. At any rate, I can slide this knot right along. It's still a loose knot. I haven't pulled it tight. I slide it along on the rope. And now it leaves the manila, and now it's on the cotton. Now I keep sliding it along, now it's on the nylon. So it's all, suddenly it's off the end. We say, the knot, the knot was a pattern integrity. It wasn't manila, it wasn't cotton, it wasn't nylon. It, though, cotton and nylon and manila, any one of them were good to let us know about its shape what his pattern was, but they, it was not that. It, was, it had an integrity in its own. We drop a stone in the water, and the most beautiful circular wave emanates. And, and I could then try it in, in milk, and it works as well. I try in kerosene, so I discover that that wave is a pattern integrity. And then the next thing that uh, I try is say, I'd like to know about that. That wave apparently isn't just water, and it isn't milk, and so then I try sprinkling sawdust all over the water. Very neatly, a beautiful film of, of sawdust. Then I drop one piece of red popcorn on it, and I put a transit and a moving picture camera very carefully aimed at that red popcorn. We drop the stone over here in the water, and the yellow sawdust makes a wave, and suddenly the red popcorn goes out from the center of the earth, into the center of the earth, comes right back where it was. They simply went in and out towards the center of Earth to accommodate the wave to let it go by. This is a piece of rope accommodated the knot sliding along on it. Synergy means behavior of whole systems unpredicted by the behavior of their parts. The most extraordinary example of it is what we call mass attraction. One great massive sphere and another massive sphere hung by tension members are attracted to one another. We find then there's nothing in one sphere in its own right that predicts it's going to be attracted to another. You have to have the two. It is then the synergy which holds our Earth together with the moon. And it's our, it is our synergy which holds our whole universe together. Synergy is a companion word to the word energy. Synergy means behavior of whole systems unpredicted by behavior of any of the parts. Is the only word that means it. The fact that humanity has unfamiliar with the word means that humanity is not, does not think there are behaviors of wholes unpredicted by parts. The very essence of our solar system, our whole scheme of our universe, is held together by these synergetic behaviors. The speed of light had not been measured we came into this century. And with the measurement, and nobody even supposed that light had a speed. Therefore, all of the scientists before our century, looking at the stars, assumed that every star was always right there. We had what we call instant universe. 
which was a complete misapprehension. If you had instant universe, universe was in a sense a thing, a static. With Einstein's paying great attention to Michelson Morley's experiment, which de demonstrated the light does have speed, it takes eight minutes for light to get to us from the sun, it takes us light two and a half years to get to us from the next nearest star, that you're looking at one star out here at night and, and it's a live show taking place 30,000 years ago. The light just getting here this second. Right next to it is a star, a live show 3,000 years ago. Right next to it is a live show 20 years ago. Einstein said quite clearly, our universe is an aggregate of non-simultaneous and only partially overlapping events. Each one of these is transforming. Some of those stars are not even there anymore. The, uh, uh, he said a scenario, universe is a scenario. As for instance, we have a man who's born and then he gets to be a father and he has his children, grandchildren, then he dies. They go on. But looking at the sky here, we're still seeing grandfather. <laughs> So we're getting really the scenario report to us in, in an odd manner, very Ill, 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 disorderly way. But universe's scenario, now that is just of this century that we think that way and, and society is not yet thinking that way. But also then in view of the entropy, Einstein said, I see that this child is growing up and getting bigger. Therefore, I don't think as the scientists have been thinking up to then, that the energies were always the universe running down. He said, I think when the energy leaves this local system, it goes, it is taken on by another system. Scientific review of experiments shows that's exactly what was going on. So only in this century have we come to discover that the energies are not lost, the universe is not running down, and our new norm is not, Einstein's norm, which is that energy is always transforming, and the very highest velocities at which things can transform or change, the rate which energy goes right away from itself radiantly, which was at the speed of light. So 186,000 miles a second is normal. Any, anything we call matters where the energies trip themselves up like knots and develop local constriction and become something we call matter. But they're going around at the same speed, but very, very locally. Every local system giving off energy then must be affecting it other systems. We find this is exactly what goes on. All the living creatures, for instance, are continually affecting the environment. The environment becomes changed and the changed environment affects the creatures. This is the way in which the universe is evolving. Therefore, change is constant and change is normal. It's only since Einstein that change has become normal. I think of my first grand strategy of finding out how to use the world's resources so they will take care of everybody would come back then to how to take care of his living equipment. Uh, this brought me then to what I call the Dimaxian Tower House, the 4D Tower House. And it was a 10-deck building which was so light and so strong as finally engineered that it could be carried by the Graf Zeppelin which was about to be built at that time and was perfectly flyable uh, economically to the North Pole where it could be anchored. I gave myself then the task of designing a building which would house an airplane maintenance crew which we'd be able to install in remote places in the Arctic so that we'd have stepping stone flights to Europe via the Arctic. Uh, once I'd proven this feasibility of flying a whole building 10 decker to North Pole, I then turned to the idea of the single family. So I developed what I call the single family Dimaxian house. I found that I could produce a house for a family of five that weighed only three tons. It looks like a house hung in a pole simply because there's a wire wheel construction, has less weight, so I turn the wire wheel over on its side. The hub is now a mass. It had red space in it, good sized bedrooms, each with a bath, a large living room, utility room, library, sun deck in the top, and hangar and garage down below. The whole thing came out then three tons, that is. I found a house equivalent to the, that kind of facility with all the accessories in it. And the conventional way of building at that time ran over 150 tons, so that this, this was a very, very small fraction of the total weight. This then brought me to a whole series of additional experiences. Later on, 20 years later, in 1947, I developed in the Beach Aircraft Company in Wichita, Kansas, the first actual Dimaxian house. I built then with the aircraft industry extraordinary structural capabilities. 
to my great pleasure, that first house of the same size came out just exactly three times, proving my estimates of 1927 to have been exactly correct. In 1933, I turned the money which I'd been given into cash I had in my pocket and I arrived in, 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 Detroit, in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut to produce this, this new uh, ground taxing quality of the omni medium transport. Because it had just been going to go on the ground, I knew people would call it an automobile. It wasn't designed just to be an, an automobile at all. Uh, she was so extraordinarily stable, my center of gravity was very, very low, and for the first, first vehicle that ever had the center of gravity forward to the midpoint of the wheelbase did prove to be a very good vehicle and did have very high efficiency. I had 11 passengers. I averaged over 22 miles a gallon. Sometimes I got as much as 30 with 11 passengers. It was very, very high. A front steered car with the kingpins can only steer up to 34 degrees angle. My rear rudder post I could turn so I could give it 90 degrees rudder if I wanted. This meant then when I wanted to come into to park, there would be a space just say six inches longer than my Dimax in car, I'd simply bring my nose into the curb and then throw my rear wheel sideways and she went running and flopped like that. Now that we then know that time is measured by cycles and lines are so many cycles long, we begin to think about patterns in, in a very mutable kind of a way. As for as I got here a necklace, it's just a necklace because I can drape it over my shoulders. It's drapable. And the reason it's drapable is that the angles are all varying. The lines, which are such and such a length, because they say, let's say one of these lines here is so many frequencies long, so many heartbeats you get from here to there. Each one of those lines is staying the same. The lines are not changing, so what is changing here is the angles. I'm going to take out one of the necklace fronts. Let that go out. So she's still nice and flexible, and she's still draping over me. Now I'm going to take out one more of those. And it still is flexible. You and I tend to call what we have left here at the present time a square. But it really isn't a square, because it, it just oh, it's a diamond, it can, and it can drape over my... It's a necklace that can hang over my shoulders like that, completely flexible that way. It can fold up into just being, look like one. I'm going to take out one more bead out of that necklace. And suddenly, a very extraordinary thing happens. No longer is it flexible. For the first and only time, I can put it over my head here, but it doesn't flex or drape at all. The angles won't change. This is what we call a triangle. Now, the triangle, if I were to take out one more, there wouldn't be any, any area at all. So I have a limit condition where I've gone down to where it suddenly stops flexing, which means that the angles don't change anymore. We knew the lines weren't changing at all. So it was all an angle. So triangle turns out to be the what we'll call structure. Let's take one pair of these sides. They're like levers, and if you have a pair of scissors or pliers, you know, the further you come out here, the more work you can do. You have more leverage advantage. So we come to the very ends of these levers, and then we put another push-pull member in here, and it stabilizes the opposite angle. So a triangle is a, is a pattern where each side stabilizes the opposite angle with minimum effort. What we call, then, a structure in our universe is a complex of energy events which are inter-self-stabilizing. And the triangle is the only inter-self-stabilizing set of a complex of, of, of events. So triangle is structure. A vector represents an energy action in a specific direction. So we have each of those as a half quantum one half consisting of actual vectors. And this is the way the physicist would express himself. Now I'm going to show you that these two can come together. They could by themselves come together and form a, a beautiful thing, a triangle like that. But I can have these two of them come together, these, which we can call them two triangles we wanted, and I'm going to have always the positive end will always come in, that is the open end will always come into a closed end where there's another end joining. You might call this male, call that female. Come the male and the female. I'll always have these two join as male to female. 
In other words, there's a constant way of joining. No special condition comes up. So here's a male, it must come to female. So here's male coming to female. Here's another male, must find female. Here's female. Now I have one, one male left, I must find one female left. So suddenly then, our two events have come together, made our friend tetrahedron. We'd like to find its relationship to the other basic structural systems. We have then, for instance, the octahedron. Now we find that it has the same, equal, same le length vector. So uh, how, however here, four equilateral triangles instead of, uh, there are eight equilateral triangles, there are twice as many triangles as there are in this system. We had one more basic structural system in the universe, and that was the icosahedron. Icosa with this 20, icosa meaning the Greek for 20, and here is the, the icosahedron. And there are only three basic structural systems in the universe, so this is the one that gives me the most volume the, uh, with the least structure. This is the one that gives me the sharpest, the greatest strength, because these three legs, like any tripod, are much more vigorous in their support. As they begin to flatten out like that, like your own legs spreading out, get less weaker and weaker. So here the legs were out very flat, and, and it is not anywhere nearly so strong. But it still is strong because it is trying to our basic structure. The crystal-shaped tetrahedron. His dome at Woods Hole, Massachusetts, seems to create itself out of this new mathematics. Lines of force reach out into the spherical continuum of the air-ocean to embrace the form that will do the most with the least. More mind, less matter. The dome rises with the controlled simplicity of a natural event. Indwelling process takes outward visible form. A house or a radiolarium, a spider's web or a star. In Detroit, Michigan, his dome for the Ford Rotunda. The basic unit is an aircraft aluminum alloy strut. Three feet long, weighs only five ounces. 19,680 of them make up this 93-foot clear span dome. The dialogue between tetrahedron and evolving sphere work in a union of opposites, a motion of push and pull, nature's breathing and regenerative process. The impulse of energy that activates growth is riveted to its opposite, control of growth. Molecular tension seesaws with compression. Outward and inward space respond to each other, sphere within sphere, swell and open to a careening geometry of Gothic immateriality. The International Trade Fair Dome at Tokyo rises as of itself. The entire dome is packed into one DC-4, flown overseas and set up by unskilled labor within only 48 hours after delivery. The aluminum grid frame is dressed in white sailcloth. It has done service in Poznan, Kabul, Rangoon, Osaka, Milan, Bangkok, Damascus, Lima, Casablanca. Now, skin and bones are blended, impressed into aluminum pans. Manufactured in Oakland, California, the 145-foot Kaiser Dome was erected in Honolulu in 22 hours. A 
At the 22nd hour, the Hawaiian Symphony Orchestra and the audience of 1,500 persons were seated. Swiftly raised in Hawaii, Virginia Beach, Virginia, Moscow, USSR, Abilene, Kansas, Fort Worth, Texas. Materials are interchangeable, and where metal would be detected by enemy radar, the module is a polyester fiberglass pan. The Air Force required a structure that could be flown and set up within a 20-hour weather margin and withstand 150 mile per hour wind. The radomes of the distant early warning system along the Arctic perimeter, radar proof. The uh, number of people are now talking about roofs over cities is very, very large. It's now getting to be accepted uh, logic in, in the, the bigger planning and so forth. It's getting into, it's getting into, the, into the lingo. And it's the Garden of Eden. It's very small compared to talking about cities, but it, it certainly uh, opens up the thoughts about such larger undertakings. Every time you double the size of a dome, your energy conservation goes up very rapidly. We get something the size of a city, and the energy conservation will be such that the enormous kinds of problems they're having today about heat, heat uh, control and the air conditioning and enormous energy power would be reduced to almost, almost negligible. And the dome on the city size, you just would not be aware of the grid at all. It would just be not quite as bright. In this Expo Dome, we have a three-quarter sphere, so the walls start going away from you, and there's a very extraordinary psychological effect of this releasing you. Inside, suddenly realize that the walls really are not there. There is something that's keeping the rain away from you. It's like an umbrella above you. You don't feel shut in. So here we now have what they call the vector equilibrium with eight triangles and six squares. I'm going to articulate it. I'm going to take this top triangle, and it must be lowered towards the triangle on the table. And the triangle on the table mustn't twist, and the tri triangle up here mustn't. Just simply lower towards it. So as I start to do that, here we suddenly become the icosahedron stage. And I keep on, keep lowering. The point still stays out towards you, and lower, lower suddenly becomes the octahedron. So we see a complete transformation from the vector equilibrium through the icosahedron down to the octahedronal condition. Now supposing, and we see all the vectors have been doubled up, all the edges have been doubled up, so this is very powerful. Now supposing this were a f force, I, if I pull on it here, this forces it to contract. Supposing this were revolving in space, the whole group of stars, another great star group here made a mass of traction and simply retarded this thing, then it would force it to contract. Now supposing the contraction and then the direction I see it coming around towards me like this, now this would make this top suddenly twist, torque, and plunge through in this manner to become the tetrahedron. So now we've gone through a great complete trans set transformation from vector equilibrium through icosahedron through octahedron down to the tetrahedron or the three basic structural systems in the universe. Now we'll unwind again, up we come, back again to our friend the ve vector equilibrium, and we find that this pumps, sometimes it's called the jitterbug, pumping, 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 but the center is not twisting. This point I mean, always stays towards you. So we have the whole system is contracting symmetrically. All 12 points approach a common center at a symmetrical rate. We have a very extraordinary matter in engineering here. Supposing then you will have a pressure on the roof of your building. You're used to the idea of the building flattening. But if the pressure on the top of the building here means that the whole building contracts symmetrically. They, they, 
vector equilibrium contains the whole phenomenology of the structure of universe. Vector equilibrium is never witnessed by man. It is as pure as God. It is truth that is approached. It is exactitude that is approached. The nearest thing to the total patterning of all the patterns of complexity in the universe that we can find to the universe itself is man. Now that I'm sitting here, 83 years of age, thinking back how 52 years ago I committed myself to spend the rest of my life trying to develop environment controls for humanity, but you did give them the most possible advantage with the least cost. Then I think about all the different kinds of structures we've tried out, coming really great simplicity of this one. At any rate, here I suddenly realize that we're doing a very, very great deal with very, very little. The dream is really coming true. People say to me, I wonder what it'd be like to be on a spaceship. And I say to you, you don't really realize what you're doing because Everybody is an astronaut. You all live aboard a beautiful little spaceship called Earth. 